Today, we become legends. So with the launch of Year 10 Smite, there's probably a lot of new or returning players that might be free to play or don't own the God Pack and only have access to mostly free gods, at least at the start. Well, in today's video, I want to provide a brief guide for every permanently free god in Smite. Whether you want to watch the whole way through to see what they're all about and choose a first main, or just skip around to a few of the gods you're interested in and get some info on how to play them, this video has you covered. Quick note that before we start, Smite has a free god rotation where gods become free for a limited time and then rotate out. Naturally, I can't and won't be covering these ones, only the 12 permanently free gods. Each god will have a brief overview at the start so you can get an idea if you like them or not, then I'll cover their abilities and item builds. I want this video to be a resource you can come back to with all the gods covered in one place. Timestamps will be on the timeline bar of the video and I'll be dividing the gods up by class, but without further ado, let's jump in. Bologna, I sense a battle approaching. Let us hope our enemies have skill. So Bologna is the first of two free warriors and is focused more on basic attacks as opposed to the other free warrior, Chuck, who is focused more on abilities. Bologna's core gimmick is her weapon swapping mechanic. Each of Bologna's three basic abilities will change her weapon on use. Shield Bash gives her a sword and shield, Bludgeon gives her a hammer, and Scourge gives her a whip. These weapons each have their own attack chain and effects which we'll cover in a second. Bologna is an aggressive, in-your-face bruiser that likes to be constantly fighting. So Bologna's passive, Master of War, gives her increased movement speed and protections when hitting or being hit by basic attacks. This stacks up to 5 times. Bologna's 1 is Shield Bash. She dashes forward a short distance, dealing damage and slowing enemies in the cone in front of her and gaining a block stack for each god she hits. Block stacks absorb the next basic attack you are hit by and reflect 30% of the damage back to the attacker. As mentioned in the overview, Shield Bash switches Bologna's weapon to Sword and Shield until she switches weapon again using another ability or leaves combat. Every third basic attack on a god using Sword and Shield grants Bologna a block stack. Bludgeon is Bologna's second ability. She spins her hammer in a circle around her doing small damage, then slams down in a line in front of her dealing heavier damage that is increased for each god she hit with the spin attack. Bologna switches weapon to her hammer which makes her basic attacks hit all targets in front of her instead of just one and has a slower but more damaging hit chain. This is Bologna's primary way to clear minion waves. Scourge is Bologna's 3 which is a line attack that damages and disarms enemies hit. Afterwards Bologna basic attacks with her whip which has extended range and heals her every third basic attack. Great for making long trades with enemies or healing up off of minions. And finally Bologna's ultimate is Eagle's Rally. She jumps forward and plants a flag at the location, stunning and damaging enemies hit while the flag stays around for 8 seconds, buffing yours and allies power and protections in the area. The ultimate doesn't swap Bologna's weapon, only her basic abilities do this. So Bologna makes best use of being tanky with some attack speed and on basic attack hit effects to synergize with her unique weapons. Here's an example build for you to use on Bologna but as you get more experience be sure to experiment with different items and see how you like them to build your knowledge with the character. Shock! They will crush our enemies and the rain shall wash them away! As I mentioned in Bologna's overview, Chak is the ability damage focused warrior of the two who relies more on slamming big numbers in large circles with his abilities. He's the easier to play of the two in my opinion and has high sustain thanks to free ability cast from his passive and great healing from his rain dance ability. Chak likes to dive in, hit as many people as possible with his area of effect abilities, sustain himself through healing and free abilities, refresh his cooldowns and do it all again. Chak's passive overflow provides him a free ability cast that costs no mana and has a 2 second reduced cooldown. The catch is that he has to basic attack a target 5 times to stack this up. Simple but effective, since Chak is heavily ability reliant, having free casts that have less downtime is crucial for him. Chak's 1 is his bread and butter. Thunderstrike launches an axe forward, dealing damage in a circle and leaving the axe in the ground for 5 seconds. This axe interacts with other abilities which we'll get to in a second, and this is Chak's main way to poke enemies from range and clear minion waves. Chak's second ability is Torrent. Chak swings his axe, dealing damage in a circle around him and gaining bonus protections per enemy hit for 6 seconds. If Chak's axe is in the ground from Thunderstrike, he instead dashes to the axe's location, damaging enemies on the way, and then performs the spin attack. This is Chak's main combo he uses for damage with 1 into 2, as well as his only way to get mobility within his kit, so use it wisely. You can often play mind games with enemies where you place the axe in one area, run the opposite way, and the enemy has to guess whether you'll keep running that way or dash to the axe. Chax 3, Rain Dance, summons a rainstorm at his location for 6 seconds. While active, enemies in the storm are slowed and have reduced attack speed, while Chak heals every 0.5 seconds. If Chak's axe from Thunderstrike is in the ground, he will summon an additional storm at the axe's location with a larger area. This is as well as his own storm, not instead of. This ability is Chak's main way to sustain himself in long fights, but can also be deadly when used correctly since if you use it with the axe, the slows will actually stack on top of each other, making enemies extremely slow and lowering their attack speed a ton. 
And finally, Chuck's ultimate is Stormcall. Chuck charges up his axe and slams the ground in an area, damaging and knocking up enemies while silencing them for 3 seconds. In the wind-up animation, Chuck has 70% damage mitigation and crowd control immunity. This ultimate is best used in big fights where you can knock up and silence several targets at once. The silence is great for stopping enemies retaliating to your engage or jumping away from your follow-up damage. This combined with the movement and attack speed slow of Rain Dance makes enemies powerless to defend against you, with no access to abilities from the silence, moving slower and also basic attacking slower too. So as an ability damage focused warrior, Chak makes best use of being tanky with health and protections, as well as slotting in some cooldown reduction for more ability users, with some potential for power in the build as well. He does decently with power. Here's an example build for Chak. Kukulkan. Let's send them shivers down their spines. Moving into the mages, of which we have three, first up is Kukul Khan, who combines easy minion wave clear with some more challenging to hit line skill shots to deal heavy burst damage and dot damage to his opponents. Lacking a traditional dash, Kukul Khan makes use of a massive movement speed buff with slow immunity to get around the fight and keep himself safe. Kuku is a pretty traditional burst mage that hits hard from long range and is reliant on having abilities up as often as possible. First up, Kukul Khan's passive, Power of the Wind Jewel, simply converts 4% of his maximum mana into magical power, incentivizing builds that involve mana and providing that little bit more power than your average mage. Zephyr is Cuckoo's second ability and this is a line skill shot that damages and slows enemies hit on a pretty short cooldown. This is your go to poke tool for chipping down enemy gods from range. Slipstream is that movement speed buff I mentioned in the overview, providing up to 80% movement speed that decays over the 4 second duration. He also cleanses slows and becomes immune to new ones for a short time on use. This is Cuckoo's primary movement tool for dodging attacks, repositioning, chasing enemies and running away. Whirlwind is his third ability, this summons a storm at the target location that puts tornadoes on enemies inside it. These tornadoes last 2.5 seconds and deal damage every 0.5 seconds for 5 ticks total. The storm itself lasts 4 seconds and enemies that stand in the storm get the duration of their personal tornado refreshed every 0.5 seconds. This ability is iconic for its excellent minion wave clear since minions are dumb AIs that can't help but stand in the storm for most of its duration taking huge damage. This can also hit gods with good prediction of their movement and or using the slow from Zephyr to stop them escaping it on deploy. And finally, Kukulkan's legendary ultimate Spirit of the Nine Winds summons a giant dragon thing that after a short delay hits all enemies in the line in front of Kukulkan for massive damage and knocks them up and away. This has great range but his hitbox is progressive so it takes further time to reach its tip range, making it harder to hit the further out your target is. Being a heavily ability reliant burst mage, Kukul Khan enjoys mostly magical power, penetration to get through enemies defences and cooldown reduction for more abilities, plus some extra mana for synergy with his passive. Here's an example build for Kuku, but as always, experiment around with your items if you want to once you're comfortable with him. Poseidon. Rising tides, drown those who stand against me! Poseidon is an ability burst mage heavily reliant on his release the Kraken ultimate that can devastate a fight with its huge damage in a large area. He has a tide meter to manage on his passive that fills up from basic attacking and can be spent to empower his abilities with bonus damage. Poseidon is a mage that likes to go all in and ask questions later. Poseidon's passive changing tides is that meter I just mentioned. Basic attacking enemies grants tide on hit and Poseidon gains increased movement speed based on how much tide he has. Using abilities takes away some tide to deal up to 20% bonus damage. Poseidon's one is Tidal Surge. This is a simple line damage ability that slightly knocks back enemies hit and deals damage. It's quite slow traveling and so it's often harder to hit at max range so you want to either be a bit closer to your target or use some setup CC to guarantee the hit. Trident is Poseidon's 2 which is a basic attack augment that splits his basic attacks into 3 that go out in a cone shape in front of him. At close range you can get all 3 shots to hit the same target for high damage or from longer ranges they will spread out a little bit more and hit multiple targets. This ability is key for building up Poseidon's tide meter since it counts as 3 basic attacks instead of 1 and gains triple the tide per basic attack because of that. Do note though that only one of these hits will activate basic attack item effects, not all 3 sadly. Whirlpool is Poseidon's 3 which after a short delay summons a whirlpool on the ground that cripples enemies and weakly pulls them towards the center, dealing damage every 0.5 seconds for 3 seconds. This ability can be great for setting up his 1 at longer ranges and is crucial for landing his deadly ultimate which we'll talk about now. This is also his main way to clear waves for the most part. So Poseidon's ult is the main reason you want to play the character, it's his defining feature and the way he gets half his kills. On use, it releases the Kraken at the target location, dealing massive damage to enemies in the centre and knocking them up plus stunning them as well. Enemies further out from the centre won't be knocked up or stunned, just slowed and take less damage. So as I mentioned, you want to always be using Whirlpool to cripple enemies first, preventing them from jumping or dashing away from the Kraken because it does have a small amount of cast time in which people can react and jump away. So once you get that cripple down, you can just nuke them for huge damage and CC, following up with your one and trident basic attacks on the stunned enemy if they're not dead already. 
So despite having a somewhat basic attack oriented second ability, Poseidon is usually built full ability based. If you want to have a bit of fun, you can mess around with attack speed builds and basic attack synergies, but he is best used with full power and cooldown reduction to release the Kraken as often as possible on his enemies. Here's an example build for Poseidon, but as always, change things up if you want to. Uluron, I have come to pacify the evil and bring light from the darkness. So right off the bat, Oleron is not your typical mage. He is one of a handful of mages that are classified as magical ADCs. Basically, a magical ADC plays more like a hunter than a mage, but still deals magical damage. Oleron is one of these, relying more on attack speed and basic attack synergies, being the only magical god in the game that can critical hit, and having a powerful basic attack steroid within his kit. If you enjoy hunters or want to try a more unorthodox mage kit that isn't a standard burst mage like Kokan or Poseidon, Oleron might be worth a try for you. Oleron's passive, Touch of Fate, is that magical crit chance I just mentioned. Oleron gains crit chance based on his power from items, up to 70% max. His crits also only do 50% increased damage instead of the usual 75% increase of physical crits. Oleron gains an extra 5% magical power and damage to his basic attacks from this passive as well. His 1, Focus Light, is a channeled line damage ability that gains increased range the longer you channel it, up to 2 seconds. This will pass through minions and stop at the first god hit, dealing damage and providing stacks of overflowing divinity for his 2, which we'll get into in a second. This ability can also critically hit using his passive. Focus Light is Oleron's main way to clear the wave and his main poking tool since it does solid damage, has amazing range and can crit. The 2 Overflowing Divinity is Oleron's basic attack augment. On activation he gains 40% attack speed for up to 6 seconds. During this time each basic attack hit grants a stack of Inner Sun up to 20. At any time during the ability or up to 4 seconds afterwards, Oleron can refire this ability to shoot projectiles in a circular area based on how many stacks he had at the time. These stacks persist through multiple uses of the ability, so you don't necessarily need to fire it every time you use the ability, you can wait to get up more stacks and fire it later for better damage. As mentioned, Oleron's 1 also provides these stacks of Inner Sun for each enemy's hit, so you can activate your 2, then fire your 1 through the wave and instantly get 6 stacks of this. And then you can use the second portion of this ability to either finish off clearing the minion wave or poke enemies, etc. Consecration is Oleron's 3, which is a bit simpler than the 2. Oleron consecrates the ground around him, damaging and slightly knocking back enemies while healing himself and allies near him and granting increased protections based on how many allies healed. This is mainly used as a get off me tool since Oleron has no traditional dash or jump to keep himself safe. He can knock away enemies, heal up and gain bonus protections and continue the fight or run away. And finally, Oleron's ultimate, Sanctified Field, is completely unique within Smite. Oleron creates a large field that slows time in the area for enemies and speeds up time for Oleron. His allies are unaffected by this. This time slow or speed up affects almost everything in the game, so enemies attack slower, cast slower, move slower, even animate slower, etc. And on the flip side, Oleron's moves, attacks, animations, and casts all are faster. This ult is hugely impactful when used right, but has a very long cooldown for that reason, so make sure you use it wisely. Once Oleron deploys this on his enemies, they become completely neutered and he becomes a super soldier while in the sanctified field. So as I mentioned throughout, Oleron is a magical ADC and so he doesn't typically build like a burst mage. He wants to be a bit more focused on attack speed and basic attack effects alongside power and penetration. You want at least a solid amount of power in your build still because of that passive. You need 700 magical power to get the maximum 70% crit chance out of it. Here's an example build for Oleron to get you started. Me. The world is no barrier to me. So moving on from the magical hunter to the actual hunters, first up we have Neath, who is the first god introduced to you in Smite's tutorial, and is somewhat of a noob magnet for that reason. She is, however, a pretty decent choice for new players if you know how to actually play her properly. With a fairly simple kit of abilities with high burst damage and an ultimate that is global and can affect the fight no matter where Neath herself is on the map, she can have a big impact while being relatively simple to play. Neath's passive, Broken Weave, leaves behind a weave on the ground when an enemy god dies that lasts for one minute. Her abilities can interact with these weaves to get bonus effects. The one, Spirit Arrow, is a line damage ability that roots enemies on hit for up to two seconds. If Neath hits a Broken Weave with the arrow, it explodes, dealing the ability's damage again to all enemies in a circular area. If an enemy is hit by both the arrow and the weave explosion, they do take both hits of damage, and this effectively doubles the damage of the ability in that case. Neath's 2 Unravel deals damage in a circular area, healing Neath per enemy hit up to 3 and reducing attack speed of enemies hit. Any weaves in the area are consumed to heal Neath extra health on top of the 3 enemies cap. Backflip Neath 3 is her generic movement ability, she flips backward a solid distance, damaging and slowing enemies in front of her as well as creating a broken weave at her original location. This is Neath's main safety so don't overuse it aggressively, I see a lot of Neath's trying to use this to generate a weave so they can use their 1 on it and while that is solid damage, if you do it too predictably it leaves you very vulnerable when your dash is down so just be careful with this. And finally, Neath's ultimate World Weaver is where a bit of complexity comes into her kit. Neath charges an arrow that can be shot at an enemy god across the map as long as she has vision of them. It can be blocked by other enemies before hitting its target, but it will go through all minions, walls, etc. 
On hit, the enemy takes big damage and is stunned for 1.5 seconds. So the classic new player mistake that needs make is using this to snipe kills on low health enemies. That can be a decent use for it sometimes, don't get me wrong, but it is better used to create presence in areas of the map that other hunters can't get to in that time. Effectively like having half an extra player in that team fight. It's also great for picking off enemies to start a fight by using the stun to initiate onto them when your whole team dives on them afterwards. Though this does require a bit of communication to pull off. So despite being a hunter, Neath is built highly ability based, usually with power, cooldown reduction and penetration as opposed to attack speed and crit chance. Her abilities hit insanely hard with high power scaling and she has no traditional attack speed steroid in her kit like most hunters do, or she can reduce enemy attack speed. Thus, she works much better playing entirely off of her ability damage and just basic attacking in between those. Here's a good build for Nice to get you started. Izanami. Midnight moonlight, surrounded by death. Izanami is a great introductory hunter and plays more basic attack focused as a contrast to the other free hunter in Neath who is highly ability based. Iza's unique basic attacks that hit all enemies in their path and return to her like a boomerang are her main selling point, giving her exceptional minion wave clear without even needing to use abilities. She can then save her abilities for poking and pressuring her enemies which gives her a really good early game presence. So first up, Izanami's passive is Death Draws Nigh. She gains 4% penetration per 10% of her missing health up to a maximum of 20% when she's below half health. This really helps with hunters as their main job late game is to shred tanks. Tanks build more protections and so 20% pen on a tank is much more effective than 20% on a squishy. Sickle Storm is Izanami's first ability and this one turns her basic attacks back into normal ones that stop at the first god hit and deal full damage instead of her unique basic attacks that pass through enemies and deal a portion of their damage on the way out and a portion on the way back. This lasts for 6 seconds and gives her up to 75% attack speed to boot. Where Izanami mainly uses her regular basic attacks for wave clear, she likes to activate Sickle Storm for more reliable damage to actual gods in fights. Iza's 2 Spectral Projection fires a demonic visage in a line in front of her, damaging all enemies in its path and slowing them for 3 seconds. If an enemy god dies while under the effect of the slow, it is increased in power permanently up to 3 stacks. This is Izanami's secondary wave clear ability if her basic attacks weren't good enough or a good poke tool that can slow down enemies allowing her to hit more of her basic attacks on them. Her 3 fade away is her movement ability. Izanami dashes a short distance and becomes stealthed. Taking damage or firing a basic attack or an ability will unstealth her. This is mainly used for escaping bad situations but can sometimes be used aggressively to sneak into the fight if you're feeling risky. And finally Izanami's ultimate is Dark Portal. After a short delay, the ground explodes in a circular area dealing heavy damage and silencing enemies hit. This is great for finishing off enemies or even initiating onto them since the silence prevents their escape from follow up basic attacks or her 2. So as mentioned, Izanami is mainly a basic attack focused hunter. While her 2 and ult do solid burst damage, they are mostly supplementary to her strong basic attacks, as opposed to Neith who more heavily relies on her abilities for damage. Here's a starter build for Izanami. Nemesis. The scales of balance have shifted. I will tip them back. So moving on to some assassins, Nemesis is first up and is the more basic attack focused of the two but still does great with full power. This is because she has really good auto attack cancels which is when you do a basic attack then cast an ability immediately after it hits to cancel the rest of the animation for faster damage. Nemesis has some of the best air cancels in the game on most of her abilities and this is how a lot of her damage is dealt. You can still play Nem to a basic level without this tech but she becomes much better with it. So first up, Nem's passive Scales of Fate steals a percentage of the enemy's power on basic attack hits. Nemesis gains 7% power and the enemy loses 7% per stack, up to 3 times. Nem's 1 is her movement ability and this is a short range double dash that deals damage and can change direction in between the dashes. She can also use basic attacks and other abilities in between them making for good AA cancels as I mentioned before, as well as being able to dash in, deal damage, then dash out or continue chasing based on the situation. Her 2 is Slice and Dice which is a cone damage ability which deals double damage and slows heavily in the centre of the hitbox. This is Nem's main jungle and wave clear ability as well as being great for slowing enemies so she can stick to them with her strong basic attacks. Nem's 3 is a shield that reflects a portion of enemy damage and heals her for the damage taken. The shield has a health limit and lasts 2 seconds so it needs to be timed correctly but when used right it can swing the fight massively as you prevent damage, heal up and deal damage back all at once. This is also Nem's fastest AA cancel for those who want to learn that tech. Hard crowd control will remove the shield for no value so be careful when using it against on demand hard CC from the enemy. And finally, Nem's ultimate Divine Judgment is a very unique ability. You target one enemy god dealing a percentage of their current health in damage, slowing them heavily and increasing Nem's own movement speed, as well as stealing 25% of their protection so they become less tanky and Nem herself becomes more tanky. Since this is percentage based it is best used on tanky targets who have more protections but it still does great on squishies as well. 
This is Nem's main way to go all in and burst the target. The movement speed and protection swing allows her to run people down with follow up basic attacks, more slows from her 2 and dashes from her 1. When your Nem ulted, it's very hard to escape, especially since Nem herself has good mobility. So as I mentioned in the overview, Nemesis is mostly an AA canceller, meaning she makes best use of high power to make each basic attack hit as hard as possible. But she can also flex into some attack speed, kin size, crit, etc if you want to go more basic attack focused. Here's an example build for Nem, but be sure to experiment since she has very flexible build paths compared to most assassins. Thanatos. The souls here are restless. I will calm them. So Thanatos is a highly ability based assassin famed for his strong early game and legendary death scythe ability. He hits hard, has an execute in his kit and comes with a mechanic that his abilities cost health to use but he has multiple ways to heal himself to offset that. Thanatos also has pretty solid air cancels too, see the nemesis section for a more in depth explanation of this mechanic. So Thanatos passive is harvester of souls, all of his abilities cost a percentage of his current health to use so you can't kill yourself with this, it's current health not max health and killing enemies restores a percentage of the targets max health to Thanatos. Enemy god kills all also reduce his active cooldowns by 5 seconds, which can allow him to snowball fights and chain kills together with his heavy burst damage. Speaking of heavy burst damage, a lot of this comes from Thanatos' most iconic ability, Death Scythe. This is a line damage ability that stops at the first target hit, dealing huge damage as well as 10% of the god's max health. This slows on hit and heals Thanatos for 75% of the damage dealt, allowing for huge swings in the early game and even late game fights. His 2 is Scent of Death which is a steroid that grants movement speed which is doubled when moving towards enemies in his instant kill threshold which relates to his ultimate. This also grants up to 35 flat penetration, greatly increasing his damage to low protection targets for the duration. His 3 Soul Reap is a cone damage ability that deals solid damage and silences enemies for 1 second. Great for preventing a jump or dash escape or interrupting channeled abilities like Anubis' Plague of Locusts. And finally, Thanatos' ultimate Hovering Death allows him to ascend to the skies for a short time. He may dive down at any time, dealing damage and stunning enemies in the area. Anyone below his instant kill threshold of 24-40% to 40 max health depending on ability rank is executed. This ability is great for finishing off kills, ganking lanes and keeps Thanatos relevant even later in the match when the damage of his death scythe stops carrying him so hard. He can still execute from 40% health which is very useful, especially against tanks when 40% of their health can be upwards of 1200 damage. In terms of builds, Thanatos relies mostly on ability damage and auto attack cancels and so benefits mostly from power and cooldown reduction. Flat penetration is still nice but less necessary since his 2 gives up to 35 free flat pen when active. Percent pen is still a nice pick up to hit tanks though. Here's a good example build for Thanatos but he has fairly flexible builds so try out some new stuff once you get the hang of him. Bugs. Yes, party time! A simple but effective guardian with high crowd control and above average burst damage for his class. Bacchus relies heavily on his legendary belly flop to engage a fight and puts out a surprising amount of damage even with a full tank build. He's a fairly well rounded guardian but does lean towards an aggressive frontline playstyle. The Drunko meter is Bacchus's passive which grants him bonuses depending on how drunk he is. He gets bonus magical power and damage mitigation for being tipsy and even more for being smashed. His abilities also get bonus effects depending on his drunk level. He gains 10% of this meter for a god kill but the main way he tops this up is through his 1. So the 1, Chug, fills his meter by 40%, heals him a small amount and grants magical power and protections for 6 seconds. This is one of the rare cases in Smite where the ability is available at level 0 with no point investment so you can get drunk in the fountain at the very start of the match before even fighting any anything and still take your normal level 1 ability. Belly Flop is Bacchus' second ability and his most iconic one. He leaps into the air and lands at a target location, damaging and knocking up enemies hit. If he is tipsy, enemies are also slow by 20% for 2 seconds after they land. This is his main way to engage fights, peel for his teammates and cause chaos. The knockup is unreducible duration wise unlike most other CCs in the game and can't be cleansed once it hits, making it one of the most powerful CC tools in the game. Belch of the Gods is his 3 which is a cone damage ability that hits 4 times with the final hit stunning enemies if Bacchus is tipsy. This also applies 50% healing reduction for 5 seconds making it extra useful against team healers or gods with high self sustain. And finally the ultimate is Intoxicate which is a large AoE damage ability around Bacchus that hits hard and intoxicates enemies for 6 seconds, making it much harder to control their movement. If Bacchus is smashed he also gains magical power for 5 seconds on use. This is fully guaranteed after belly flop leading to a huge burst damage combo and follow up CC and the intoxicate with that. While not as powerful as a stun or a knock up it's still a nuisance for enemies hit by this and it lasts 6 seconds which is pretty long. So despite his affinity for dealing damage Bacchus still builds mostly full tank often with supportive auras that provide protections or other stats to his nearby teammates. He is one of those guardians that can utilize 1 or 2 damage items in his build occasionally though but do be aware you sacrifice a lot of tankiness and team utility by doing so. Here's an example build for the drunk man himself. Emir, I am unstoppable force and 
the immovable mountain. Yumiya is a low mobility but high control guardian that excels in locking down enemies and once again has above average damage compared to your typical guardian, meaning you can still make an impact on the enemy's HP bar while controlling the fight with CC and his infamous ice wall. He's a pretty basic guardian to get into but does have some higher skill elements as well so he's great to learn for beginners. Just watch out for his lack of mobility but other than that you're golden. Ymir's passive Frostbite is applied by all of his damaging abilities and reduces enemy damage output by 10% as well as making Ymir's basic attacks deal double damage to the target for the duration. The debuff lasts 6 seconds and refreshes on subsequent ability hits. The double basic attack damage can be huge early on in the game but becomes less relevant later, whereas the 10% damage reduction is more relevant late as players get more damage online. Ymir's first ability is his iconic Ice Wall. He creates a wall that blocks player movement and lasts up to 4.5 seconds. That's it. But don't let that simple description fool you. This wall can be teamfight winning, especially when used in the tight corridors of the jungle where you can completely block someone off. It's especially powerful against enemies with no movement ability or just a dash since they can't get past the wall and become isolated from their team with good wall placement. This ability is where most of Ymir's skill expression comes from and good Ymir players will abuse this wall to the point where it's his most powerful ability. Glacial Strike is his 2 which deals damage in an area in front of him and slows for 35% for 4 seconds, applying Frostbite. The slow is surprisingly potent here and long lasting which can allow for follow up double damage basic attacks using Frostbite or his team's damage. Do note that there's a short delay before the ability actually comes out so be sure to stay well within range and or lead your target slightly to secure the hit if the enemy is moving. Frost Breath is Ymir's 3 which is a simple cone stun that does damage. It's one of the longer stuns in the game, especially on a basic ability coming in at 2.25 seconds at max rank, which if the enemy can't cleanse it can often be a death sentence in late game teamfights. This also applies Frostbite. And finally, Shards of Ice is Ymir's ultimate in which he begins channeling, becoming CC immune and charging up. Enemies in the area are heavily slowed and frostbitten. After 3 seconds, Ymir explodes, dealing massive damage to everyone in the area. This can be reactivated at any point to fire it early for reduced damage. Frostbite is reapplied upon detonation. This ability can be hard to land, especially at full charge, but with good use of his wall and his freeze, you can manage it and boy does it hit hard when you fully commit. Ymir mostly likes to go full tank and rely on his high base damages to hit hard. He likes all the supportive auras that guardians... He likes all the supportive aura items that guardians typically like to build. Here's an example build for him. Yemoja. I will bless this world with life-giving waters. It is in dire need of restoration. And finally, our last guardian and last god for the video is Yamoja. She's an extremely unorthodox guardian that is widely considered one of, if not the hardest god to play in the game. So if you're looking for a challenge, she might be for you, but if you're new to the class or the game in general, I would personally recommend sticking to Bacchus or Ymir until you get the hang of things, unless you really like the look of Yamoja's design. She's very well rounded with a bit of everything, healing, lockdown, damage, CC, a unique mana system that offers potential for crazy situations that no other god in the game can muster. Omi is that passive mana system. Instead of using mana like most smite gods do, Yamoja instead has Omi segments, which are used to cast abilities and her basic abilities have no cooldown, only her ultimate does. She starts with 7 Omi and gets 3 more at levels 6, 11 and 16. She regens Omi every 5 seconds and CDR increases that rate of regeneration. Any mana she buys is converted to health at a 20% conversion rate and she has unique basic attacks that pass through and heal allies. This system allows Yumoja to bypass a core mechanic of smite, cooldowns, to spam out several abilities in a matter of seconds and even multiple of the same ability in a row since she can spend her Omi however she likes. Once spent though she can't just wait for cooldowns like a normal god would, she has to wait for Omi to regenerate which can take a while. Yamoja's first ability has two variants. The first is Bouncing Bubble which has a unique targeter that throws a bubble which bursts into smaller bubbles and then smaller again, dealing damage and slowing enemies hit. After using Bouncing Bubble her one switches to Moonstrike which is another unique targeter that cascades from the sides inwards where enemies are stunned in the middle and take damage on hit. On using Moonstrike her one reverts back to Bouncing Bubble and repeat. Mending Waters is her 2 which sends out a wave of water that damages enemies it passes through and will heal and shield the first allied hit, bouncing to all nearby allies after that and applying the heal and shield to them too. This is really powerful for group healing and is somewhat resistant to anti-healing effects since half the effect is a shield. And of course Omi allows this to be used several times in quick succession with no cooldown which can be super strong for disengaging, healing up and re-engaging in teamfights. Riptide is Yamoja's 3 which creates a water ring that bounces enemies and allies towards or away from Yamoja based on where in the target as she placed the ring. Far out launches enemies towards her, closer in launches enemies away. Enemies that get hit by a ring are also slowed while allies who get hit by the ring gain bonus protections and movement speed. Omi can chain these rings together for some incredible lockdown or team transport capabilities. 
And finally, her ultimate Rivers Rebuke allows your Moja to summon two giant walls of water that block player movement and apply a decaying slow to enemies inside. Yamoja herself gains massively increased Omi regeneration while inside the ult and for 4 seconds afterwards, allowing her to spam many abilities. After 5 seconds, the walls crash down dealing damage, slowing and trembling enemies hit. Using this in combination with terrain walls and or riptides can make cages with few or no ways out and can be extremely deadly. So Yamoja builds mostly the same as a typical guardian with auras and tankiness but does have a few specific stats and items she looks for that other gods don't necessarily. She likes CDR much more than typical guardians for Omi regeneration since without it she literally can't cast abilities. So items like Kronos Pendant or Breastplate of Valor are much more popular for her than your typical support. As well as some of the healing specific items like Lotus Sickle can be good as well. Here's an example Yamoja build to get you started. But that's all I've got for every free god in Smite on how to play and build them. Hopefully this video has helped you out in choosing a main or learning how some of these gods work to a basic level if you're just starting out with the game. Don't forget to drop a like before you leave and subscribe to the channel as I put guides out like this all the time. I'll catch you guys in another one later on. Have a great day and peace out you nerds.